Hey, Uwe Berlin and the Virus Stars Institute. Uh, and uh, please, Peter. Thank you. Uh, so thanks again for having me. I wish I could be there in person, maybe next time. And um, so here's my title, Rough Analysis of Rough Volatility Models. And what this talk is about is basically I will show you three recent pieces of work that have a common theme. And the common theme is that there is some application to, to finance, at least uh, at the horizon, in some cases very precise, in some cases a bit further. But what's unifying here is the, the way of, you know, thinking that we use methods of what's nowadays called rough analysis that goes back to rough paths that were devised by Terry Lyons now almost 30 years ago. So not that new anymore. But these methods have been very successful in analyzing, you know, wild stochastic and deterministic also differential equations. And they had a major impact in the analysis of SPDEs from, um, from mathematical physics, for instance. And so you can do all this. It's great fun. And so rough analysis by itself has become now, uh, even on the roadmap of mathematics, the math, uh, the science classification, this is now a whole domain with the so 60L. If you know 60H is the casting analysis, 60L is rough analysis. So this is a huge topic. And at the same time, it has a priori nothing to do with finance or rough volatility. And you can have a happy life doing rough volatility, like let's say Jim Gatterall or Mathieu Rosenbaum or others. Um, and so the point of today's talk is that there's a significant overlap so so there's the good reasons why you want to connect these two okay that's the underlying theme and uh well personally i've been very happy with this development how it comes together so let's get started here's the overview so um one two three we will start with um the so-called rough pergomi model that was introduced by Christian Bayer, who should be on site or nearby, Jim Gatherell and myself several years ago. And there we will talk about the so-called weak rate problem. That's a very simple to formulate problem that has intrigued many people, including myself. And also this is joint work I will point it out later with um, William Solkett uh, and Thomas Wagenhofer, who is also on site. Then we'll talk about uh, models or methods, really. I will not so much talk about the Heston model itself, but I will talk about methods that allow you systematically to compute moments in such models and more precisely, moments on pass space called expected signatures. And that's work with um, uh, Paul Hager and Nicolas Tapia, both still in Berlin. And last not least, uh, I will talk about the recent project with Peter Bank, also Christian Payer and Luca Tsari, who is also uh, with you, I believe. So, um, you know, whatever questions you may have that I cannot answer at the end of today's talk, you have people on site who may be able to, uh, you know, point you to further things, or you write me an email, I'm very happy. To. So let me take a step back before we drill into one of these three precise topics here. Um, this is something that I like very much. So this is a very generic stochastic wall setup. So here you have your, let's say your log normal, well, in the Black-Scholes model, this would just be your constant volatility, this guy here. And so here we randomize it. So these are very classical um, models of stochastic volatility type. And so equivalently, you can switch to a log price. Many people do this. So because you're looking at some positive um, local martingale here anyway, you switch to, or you can introduce log price here, get rid of dimensions. And if this log price, that's a semi-martingale, we are looking throughout at continuous processes here. So if this semi-martingale here has a differentiable quadratic variation process, then you call it a spot variance. Okay, so generically people are quite happy to assume this, but there are also some who do not. If you have the structure here, then it's a good idea to introduce what's called the um, forward 
variance. So this is this guy here. That's the forward variance. And what you can think of here, it's really, you know, if you think of this as a quadratic variation, this, this notation here means it's a quadratic variation. Start at the time little t up to time capital T. So this is a random quantity. This is F capital T measurable. You know it by time capital T. And then you take the conditional expectation. So this becomes something that you can, you know, that you know at time little t. And that has a very precise interpretation in terms of the price of a, a variance swap. Okay. And so effectively, you're taking, so these things, you know, various swaps are, are traded options. So, so these, these are prices that you can, at least in principle, observe. Now, capital T has a parameter. So if you hold term structure, you take the derivative in capital T and outcomes basically what I've written here. This is the forward variance. Okay. That has a name. So you should think of this for fixed time capital T. This is by construction, a closed martingale right so uniformly integral everything you know as long as vt is integral this gives you a very nice martingale so forward variance modeling goes back to Bula and Bergomi um make the simple remark that uh first thing is these things because these are observable these are also observable at time t so when you start your evolution let's say at time t little little t equals zero then you can, in principle, go to the market, look at the prices of variance swaps, and figure out what are what is the term structure of your forward variance curve. So at time little t equals zero, that's when you start say to look what are the what is the forward variance curve at the market, and then you know it's about evolving it. And what you know for sure is that this must be by construction here a martingale. So why not describe martingale dynamics straight away in this sense here that for every fixed capital T. Your little t runs from zero to capital T. It's a little bit like interest rates. Um, and there you have martingale dynamics. So if you believe in a in martingales on Wiener space um, that are necessarily given by by uh, integrals against Brown motion, it has to be of this form here. So for every t, in principle, you can have a different Brown motion, and there may be a complicated correlation structure. But nonetheless, for fixed capital T, this must be of this form here. It could be, I mean. Depending on how many factors you want, this could be multidimensional, of course. Okay. So when you have this whole forward variance process in your in your hands, you can always evaluate it at the diagonal and recover your stochastic variance. Okay. Now, what else is uh, is to be done? Well, there's a factor here, Brown in factor B, that drives somehow the, the asset price or the, the DS over S. And then you need some factors here for the variance or for the forward variances. And we already indicated these are these here, and there may be many on them depending on you know how many t's, how many factors you want to put in. So I indicate here that you need you may need you may you may want a lot of w's here. Okay. So this is what's known as up as forward variance uh, structure forward variance models. And there's one particular class of forward variance models that has been very popular, very successful. Namely, you just say there's only one factor that you need. So in order to drive your variance, your volatilities, you only need one additional factor, W, in addition to the B that you have here. Okay, and of course, you want to put in some correlation. I've not made this explicit in the slide here. So there's a correlation between B and W. But there's only one additional factor that drives your forward variances. And so how does it do it? Well, you have here a d psi, and here the evolution is linear in psi, but you have some Volterra structure here. So there's a kernel here. Um, and if you if you uh, solve this linear equation, there's no problem, then you can write it out in a very simple form here, where this is the so-called Wick exponential. And here you have a simple uh, Gaussian random variable because kappa here is a deterministic kernel here. So this object here is Gaussian. And so you write it in this in this Wick form. So the Wick exponential of a Gaussian is just exponential of that random variable minus one half its variance. Okay. 
And so it coincides in the case that you're looking at Gaussian martingales, it coincides with the usual stochastic exponential. But this one is the one that you want to use here. So this goes all back to my paper with Christian, this is this here, Bayer, and Jim Gatherall here. Now, special cases, kappa is exponential. Now, this is the lucky situation when you are in a Markovian framework. So this, these kernels are basically uh, just some Markovian dynamics in disguise. Um, and this was goes back to, to Bergomi. And then, you know, he had also two factor variations, etc. cetera. Um, what back then we suggested was to take a power law kernel. And well, I mean, this was the, the second paper in this rough volatility story. The first one, of course, is by Jim um, and Mathieu, uh, where they, they look at the time series that... Um, that uh, exp so suggest all this. This was the pricing companion paper. Right. So here is a power law kernel. H is less than a half. So this is really a single law kernel here. And well, if you plug this in here and then you evaluate T at capital T, so this is the, the diagonal, so that you fall back to the variance from the forward variance, then here is what the variance is. Okay. So just plug it in. In particular, so you see what's called a Fractional Brown motion, more precisely, a Volterra or Riemann Liouville fractional Brown motion. Here you have nice scaling properties. You can evaluate this, but the, I, you know, this is not the point here. And so, to a first approximation at least, the fluctuations of this guy here dominate. You know, there's a different scale here. So I just try to prepare the ground for the first paper I want to do or first uh, project I want to present to you. So I'll make the case that. Um, to, a to a first order approximation, the variance process here has really this form here. So there's a T method, let me put it in for you, T, okay? So in other words, I drop this thing here, I can keep this one constant, so you can also add some constant here, that's harmless. Um, that, so either you say you willingly ignore this and you take a flat forward variance curve, or you just say it's your lucky day and the forward variance curve and this factor here, they precisely cancel out so that you're left with this one. Okay, so either way, uh, that's what I've written here. So if you're lucky and the forward variance curve has precisely this structure, the log is equal to this guy here. Uh, I guess there's some either missing, so my apologies. Then you get this form here. Okay, right. The other example that I want to to uh, or what I should point out is that if you have the exponential curl kernel from before, and let me go back to here for a second. So here we have the situation that the dynamics are somehow log normal. I mean, you can see it here, log normal. The other special case of interest is when it's, and you don't have it linear here, but you have a square out here. So this is typically of, of Heston. And indeed, when you have an exponential kernel here, then it's just the classical Hest model rewritten in forward variance form. If you take a power law kernel as before, then it essentially becomes the rough Hest model. And the spot variance solves the Volterra differential equation that has been analyzed by many people. Uh, some of them are with you. So I didn't bother to write it out. So it's a Volterra differential equation. Um, I, I'm a strong believer that the forward variance formulation is somehow the much more elegant way to, to do it. So whenever you can try to work with the forward variance formulation, I think it's a it's there's something intrinsic about it that I like very much. Now, um, it's a remarkably, remarkably tractable model. So Jimmy used to call it God's model. I'm not sure if he still does, but it's really remarkable. For instance, you can, like in the classical Hess model, you can compute the moment generating function uh, you can compute cumulants, and when you say compute, let's let's be a bit more careful. Let's say it's analytically tractable. So in a classical Heston situation, you have these Riccati ODEs, and you may think it's a. I mean, it's clearly a great uh, step forward to move from PDE. So you, in a Markovian model, you always have a PDE for the characteristic function to an ODE. That's a major simplification. You still have to be careful with these ODEs, you know, just writing it down doesn't mean that numerics are easy. And in fact, Riccati equations can be quite, quite a challenge. But even so, this extends to the rough case. And so you have 
convolutional Riccati equation des describe you the characteristic functions. So in that sense, it is a little distractible. So there are people, not me, but others who have uh, worked a lot about how to, to implement this numerically, how to get this to run robustly. And so this is a good success story. Now, something else is so far we only dealt with, let me go back and make this explicit here. So far we only dealt with models of this type here. And then if you put this in forward variance form or not, this may be a question of taste. But now we make a, a conceptual step uh, forward and include some extra term here, right? So if I didn't have this sigma guy here, then I would be looking at exactly what we looked at before. But now we add this decorating factor. So if I would, on the other hand, remove this guy here, this square root here, then I would be left. So let me, if I would remove this, then I'm looking at the one factor time inhomogeneous Markov model. So you have all the tricks, BDE, whatever. And this is, of course, the popular Dupier model. And the question is, how do you get your sigma uh, from, from market data? But we take another view here. The Dupier model has many disadvantages. So no one really believes in its dynamics. Whereas in Stockwell, people very much, well, maybe not in Heston, but so, so Bengomi type dynamics are well liked by practitioners. On the other hand, if you have a parametric model and there are not so many parameters, you will never have a perfect fit. So here in the Dupier world, you have an infinite number of you know, parameters because you have a whole a whole surface to choose, right? And so the idea is to combine this, keep this somehow as a backbone that does the best you can of uh, fitting the market with very few parameters. And then you add this decorating factor for some fine tuning. So if you're not familiar with this material, it may look like some, some ad hoc procedure where you have a cake and you add another layer and another layer, you know, but there's beautiful, uh, so, Whatever you think about it, this model is industry standard. And the main reason why it's industry standard is that there's a very slick and deep algorithm that allows you to calibrate to this guy here on the fly. So this has to do with a uh, McKean Vlasov particle uh, system that is not part of my talk today. But this is really so if you write any paper or you read anything about these models, these are super important classes of models that are used, again, industry standard. So let's, by all means, uh, you know, honor them. So I have to go big bet back, uh, let's go back up here. So I already jumped ahead here. So previously we had Ralph Begum and Heston that were of this dynamics here. And as I said, you have to, to squeeze in some correlation between B and the fact that it drives your V your variance and that factor previously and still is called W. So w is the Brownian factor that drives your variance. B is the one that drives your DS. There's a correlation. And so usually you just, you know, install your B by hand by picking two independent brown motions, pick your variance, uh, your correlation parameter and somehow construct another brown motion by hand in this particular way. Of course, the rule bar is square root of one minus rule square as such that, so that you get another brown motion. So, well, this is, the, this is what we had previously. And again, from here, you make this conceptual step one up and include this of leverage function decoration, local wall decoration to make it a, a richer model. Okay, so why do I show you all this? Because this is somehow, at least in my, my restricted view, the, the world of stochastic volatility, where you have things like like Pergomi, so forward variance, rough Pergomi, you have Heston, rough Heston, examples of affine models. And then you have these rough uh, or, or local stochastic volatility models. So why, why do I say rough here? Well, this backbone here, this, this volatility process, you know, I haven't said anything about the V here, but you know, if you, if you go back, let's go back for a second. Boom, boom, where's my V here? It might be rough of this form here. This is the one that we had in the rough Begomi setting. Okay, so you can combine these things and it's very natural to combine them. Right. So part one, this is the work with Thomas who is on site and also William Salkett who's 
and brown, I believe. So we start with this idealized rough Begomi situation. So this is what I tried to sell you earlier, that you have this familiar form here. And you see, I, you know, this, what I've written here, X here, I'm, I'm cheating a little bit. So if you really start from DS over S equals blah, blah, then you switch to the log, then the Ito correction will tell you that, that this here is up, that here you would have another term that would would account for this Ito correction term, which is like minus one half V dt or so. So I will, I will drop this, okay? Because that allows us to have the maths a bit cleaner. And in the end of the day, you know, you start, if you start with a randomized Black Scholes model, then you do what you, you know, then you're here. Oh, this is the randomized Black Scholes. And effectively, what you're doing here is you're looking at the randomized Bachelier model. So, so it's in a sense, it's also from the financial modeling side a question of taste. So, let's do this just to have it cleaner. There's no problem extending it. Right. And then the variance process, or so square root V is the wall, V is the variance, takes this exponential form or F. You know, what you have in your mind is this exponential form of Rav Begomi, but you don't want to to uh, restrict to this too early. So, in fact, we have it for, for a reasonable class of F that includes the, the exponential form. And then there's the kernel in the background. So here's the power law kernel. We had now, maybe this is something you have to get used to in my talk. Um, if if you have a kernel that depends on H, then you, you want to put an H here maybe. And then you want to put an H here, maybe, but I don't want to write all these H's. So let's get rid of the H's and let's get rid of the H's. So H is fixed and I want to cover the regime where H is between zero and one half. So this is what, what makes it, you know, called rough volatility. Otherwise you wouldn't call it rough volatility. So this is really a fraction of brown motion. Then you stick it in your favorite function F like exponential. And then you you randomize your Bachelier model with this. You have your correlation, you know, built in as discussed earlier. So this is a you know it might be a toy model, but it's it's quite you know it has all the features that that you want. Let me point out, there's a roughness here inherited from the kernel. This guy here is rough. It's not the same as Martingale, um, but there's no rough differential equation here. In fact. All we have to do to, to solve this model or to write down the solution, whatever it means, is you integrate. Here you are. There is no differential equation. Okay, so certainly not a rough differential equation. There's, it hasn't, you know, going back to the theme of my talk, from a rough analysis perspective, you don't, don't need any fancy things here. This is Eto 101 here. You write down an Eto integral, just noting that this guy, f of w hat, is adapted to the noise you have at hand here, and this is an Eto integral. End of story. So, Ito left point approximations we learn in basic courses or teach it. If we look at left point approximations to this Ito integral, then we know by general theory that this will converge, okay? at least in probability, and then you can say much more depending on what assumptions you put. So, what is not clear from the general theory is um, what rate you have. So in stochastic numerics, and this is a stochastic numerics workshop where people are in the know, they're strong and weak. And strong is, in that case, reasonably easy because you have the moments, you have the things in your hands. So, you you know, if you make a comparison with sums, you just write out the terms and do some moment estimates. So strong is not so bad. In fact, it's, it's not bad at all. It's a rather easy exercise. And weak is really hard. So what we have for now and I'll put this in the literature in a second here. This is a paper that's hopefully soon finally accepted in AAP, which has uh, submitted the revision, is the following weak error estimates. So remember H here, H is the, the Hurst parameter. And the thing is that the weak rate is basically I mean, let's let's look at the thing here, right? There's a brown end motion here, and there's a there's a fractional brown motion here, and and here only I have written H instead of hat, you know. So instead of W hat, I've written W H, so that you can you know you make sure that you see the connection here. So this here has a scaling exponent from one half. This one has a scaling exponent from H. 
So you may say, okay, maybe the rate that we create will be, you know, if may H plus plus one half, maybe, right? I mean, in classical in, in SDE theory, you have um, you have weak strong rate one half, weak rate one. So you need you're looking for for an exponent um, for a rate that becomes one when H equals one half. So you can you can try a few things. You can try two H. You can try H plus one half. And the surprising answer is, and that's really something that was uh, first seen by Paul Garcia, I'll give a reference in a second, is that the rate is 3h plus 1 half. And of course, it can't be better than 1. So this is this, this cutoff here, OK? So the second thing for weak rates is what's the class of test function? And here, there's still room for improvement, I think. What we have is we can deal with all polynomial test functions. And this assumption is rather crucial. And so, of course, you can try some power series expansions and estimate the remainders. And uh, you don't get very far. I mean, you can write some conditions, but they are, they are not, you know, they're unreasonably strong. So, so this is not a good direction to go. Uh, on the correlation parameter, we can, you know, any correlation matters. A fun fact is that if you have correlation rho equals zero, which is not really interesting from the finance perspective, then actually have rate one. So that one we can also show, All right? And well, here it is. Um, here's my disclaimer. So we have, the, there's this F here. So what are the conditions on F? We need some growth assumptions, but fortunately this includes the exponential case. So we are happy to, Report that Ralph Begomi is included. There's also a disclaimer for h equals one over six. There's a disclaimer at one over six. They have a little bit more correction. And so let's not worry about this. In the sequel, I will also uh, focus on the case, on the interesting case, uh, what I said earlier about rho equals zero is true, but the proof in that case, you know, collapses in a sense. And so the interesting case, I think, is rho equals one or, or minus one. You can really find your f to, to, you know, to switch from one to the other. So from the maths perspective, there's no difference. All right. So here's my promised uh, view on previous works. So the first, or one of the first works was by Christian, uh, Christian and Raul and co-authors. Um, then there was a paper question with uh, Masaki Fukasaba and co-workers. Here's the, the work by Paul that I mentioned. And there's a very recent work that I, I think is quite exciting um, using path-dependent PDEs. And so they are proposing um, to go back um, to old ideas of, of Tale Tubaro, so PDE-based proofs, but now using path-dependent PDEs and making this work. So it's a, it's a tough read as a paper, but but I think this this is very exciting. So anyway, I will show you what we have. And so I will really start showing you time. Let me have an, uh, okay, I should speed up a little bit. So this is uh, really a computation that was proposed by, by Paul Garcia. And um, he only deals in the paper with cubic test functions. So, so what he wants to compare is, is, you know, this is your, this is your randomized Bachelier price at time t, and um, the payoff here is cubic, so it's cube. Okay, this is the, your base thing, and then you want to compare this with the identical expression where this is replaced by the left point sum. And there's an elegant remark that you can write the the Riemann approximation here. Um, you can write it in the same way by putting the discretization into the kernel. It's an elegant remark. It's not a difficult remark, but it means if you want to compare things term by term, then you can use the same expressions, the same algebra. You just have to update your kernel. Okay, so let's, so in other words, the computations that we do here are equally relevant for the approximations. We just later in the day need to use the, the uh, you know, a suitably uh, discretized kernel. So the way we do it is you just play around with, with Ito. So we all know how to apply Ito's formula to the cube function. This is what happens. And the other thing is, if you look at this guy here, um, you want to use Ito isometry 
to to make sense or to expand this one. So, so why isometry? Well, here you have a martingale already. X is a martingale, and if you could decompose this here in something, you know, constant plus plus martingale, which you can by by uh, ETO representation, then of course you can exploit immediately ETO isometry types. So let's do this and what is an explicit form of ETO representation called the Clark or Cohen Hausdorff um, Hausmann formula. So here it is, right? What the C is is not hard, it's just the expectation, but in the end it drops out here. If you plug it in here because XT is zero mean, it drops out. And this guy here, this is the, the beauty of the, the, um, the COH formula, um, Clark or Cohen Hausmann is that you can write this as a Mullivan derivative of, so whatever you have here, you take the, the Mullivan derivative, and then you have still to, to include some projection here. And in that case here, because everything is very simple, I mean, Mullivan derivatives of Gaussian objects are trivial basically, and then as the chain rule, you can really hack out what this is quite easily. And on the other hand, we have dx as a martingale, so there's an explicit structure here, namely the what I call two here is f of w hat s, so remember that's the fractional prior motion. And now you just apply e to isometry that allows you to expand this one into this form here. Okay, so now it's plug and play. You put this in here, you get this one, and we had this guy here, boom, you put this in here. The kernel here is deterministic, it comes out here. And so in the end of the day, your cubic price here is written as a double iterated integral. So now you see, we start with a model that is totally harmless from a rough path perspective. And yet, if you play around with it, you start seeing iterated intervals popping up. And of course, um, rough people are quite familiar and, and uh, intrigued by such objects. So no surprise that we're happy to jump on this. So. What happens when you move from cubic to quartic test functions? So this is something that Paul for sure could have done in the paper, uh, but he didn't because I, I mean, there's no point of working out four and five unless you see something general. So, so if you do four and you use similar computations, so, so as far as the maths is concerned, there are not any new tricks on play. You just have to be a bit more, more organized in plugging it in. So in view of time, I, I will spare you the, you know, the discussion of every line here. But what you get in the end of the day is the following. So the structure is important. So the quartic payoff, again, it's the last two lines, splits up into things. Oh, actually, so there's still an XS lurking around here. So there's one more step we have to go on. Sorry, here we are. So in the end of the day, this is what you get. Okay. So look at the last two lines of this expression. So equal. 24, so I'm sorry, we're still not done. I'm, this one, my apologies. Here we are, okay? So now all the x's on the right-hand side are removed. x, the quartic payoff is what we want to understand. And now on the right-hand side, we only have data of the problem. The data is f, that's the like the exponential function in the Pagomi model. The w hat is a fraction of prime motion. And then you have the kernel that shows up. It's now called capital K. It's a deterministic kernel, okay? So we have four lines and what's the structure? Well, we have these expectations that involve, um, you know, multivariate evaluations of your fractional prime motion at, you know, function on F and um, derivatives of F and products thereof. So, so you need to understand certainly the finite dimensional um, distribution of your fractional prime motion, of course you do. And uh, then you have to stick it into F and F prime, the F prime prime, et cetera, and evaluate it. And then the whole thing is integrated twice or three times. And here are products of the kernel that show up. And it's quite, you know, the structure is quite intriguing. And so you certainly don't want me to discuss this one, but the structure is the same. So you have a few triple integrals, you have a few. Um, but two integrals and the structure is the same. You have uh, the finite dimensional distributions of your W hat come into play. You evaluate that F and derivative and products. So these, these elementary differentials, how they're sometimes called. And then you, you have products of the kernels. And so it's a big mess. And so what you need to do is find a pattern in there. And in the end, the proof, I mean, you know, what are we looking for? We're looking for the weak rate. The proof in the end of the day, 
is to rewrite the, the discrete. So if you replace xt here, which is an eta integral by its discrete counterpart, some left point sum, you have the same expression, but there's a different kernel. Right? So that one, in the end, you get a term by term comparison. And so it's really important to understand how the general term looks like, and then you do term by term. So that's a very brute force approach if you wish, but it works. So to do this, um, I think I will speed up a little bit. First, you need to understand how to, I mean, what did we do so far? You've seen it in the cubic case, you apply Eto, see what happens. And then if you're in the quartic case or the quintic case, you apply Eto again, you break it up, you do it, you keep going. So this is the general thing that's in place. And it's not enough in this in this recursive formula to deal with x to the power n on the left-hand side here. You have to write down a lemma that's more general that accommodates for the appearance of all these products of you know of your fraction plan motion evaluated at different times that appear. So so in your recursive formulation, you, you have to put this in so that you can keep iterating. Otherwise you do it once and you're stuck. So this lemma here is sufficiently general in its formulation. Um, I'm reluctant to, to define all these, these things here, but what you can see here is, you know, the, the X to the power N here is the N that you get down. So this is from the Eto formula and here's the N minus one. And so if second derivative, guess what? You get N times N minus one half. And so this is just a glorified application of Eto the formula where you, you know, you're careful with the, the bookkeeping. And so once you have this thing in place here, boom, you apply it. And as I said, the right-hand side is again of this form, so you can iterate this. So if you do it, you get, you know, a big sum here, but it's finite as a linear combination of these iterate integrals. And so in the end, you know, in the end, you're just interested in f equals one, but you needed the more general form to, to get this recursion formula. So you really have to put f equals one here. The, what's called this, this yota here has a form, it's a, you know, it's, it's like an operator that acts on this f here. So here's also a recursive way of doing it. And um, let me skip this. So in the end, you get here when you plug in f equals one, you have the same form. It's just here previously had an f, now it's a one, and there's this yota that, that acts on the now the function one here. And so let me cut this stuff in between. In the end, what this here is, is again a linear combination, but finite of or sum of terms of the form psi, so, uh, so alpha x, blah, 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 blah. Let me tell you what this is here. So this is really a product of f and its derivatives. This is what we have seen explicitly in the in the quartic quintic case, and this pattern persists. And now we have somehow organized and we, we understood the combinatorics of that. And then here you have k, the, the kernels, the products, again evaluated at the right times here. So the the nice thing is that um, what you get here. If you plug this back in here, so you should really, if you have, you know, so it's this yota one here, you have to plug in this whole vector of your fractional parallel motion. So your fractional parallel motion vector, you know, vector from the different times here. And so if you do this, and the kernels are deterministic, so you can put them outside for a moment, then you really see that there's a linear combination of products of the form we call them phi t times kernel products. So the kernel products again are these here, the deterministic. We'll talk about them in a second. And what comes in before is of this form here. Boom. And now coming back to my point, when we look at the approximations, it's similar. The only thing you have to do is replace, um, you replace the kernel and more generally your time evaluation by what we call eta here. So eta is, we had it earlier, it, you just, you know, when you do Euler approximation, you have a grid, let's say of step size one over N, and this one moves you to the, to the next, to the left neighbor in your grid here. So so if you replace, we call it here phi t by this tilde phi t and k accordingly by 
the, the, the corresponding. So you can do the same for K. K is a function of ST and K tilde, you do the same thing. And then the resulting expression is exactly the one that gets you, that describes you the Euler approximation. And so now you estimate the difference of all these terms. And so if you do this component wise, then, well, it's a, it's a you know, the many pages you need to fill to write this all out. But in the end, you can estimate the difference and you get there. So here's some, something technical that maybe I should, don't want to uh, discuss in too much detail. Um, but there's one thing I, I want to show you, namely, in particular, you have to compare, let me go back to this one. You have to compare this guy here. So remember phi of t hat was this here, right? So this is, you you look at your fraction plot motion at the finite dimensional distributions, there's some test function, okay? And then you do the same where you replace t, i, t, m, phi, that basically the, the left neighbor in your in your finite dimensional in your finite grid that underlies the Euler scheme. And then you want to compare these two. Okay. And to do this, you basically have to compare such expression here. So these are expectation, a test function, and then it's a Gaussian vector. And the other one is similar, but it's a perturbation of this one where every TI has been replaced by a, by a little shift to the left. So that's a general problem here. And we were quite happy to, let me jump forward here. We were quite happy to understand that there's a, a systematic way of dealing with this. So here's the lemma. So you have a Gaussian vector here. So xt is a Gaussian vector. That means it's it's described by, so centered of course, it's described by its covariance matrix for fixed t. So t is, you can think of t as parameter. Maybe time is not what you want here. It's just a parameter. And what happens when you, you know, when you change your mind about the covariance structure, and let's assume that your covariance structure is parameterized by t in a way that this is c1 in t. Right? And then you can ask yourself, well, what happens when I change here? You think like you have two different covariances you're interested in, and then you, you know, you create some uh, a way to go from one to the other. What is the derivative here? What's the infinitesimal change? And it turns out it's a very simple PDE. And this looks like something you could prove in two seconds with e to calculus, but actually that's false. You cannot, because there's no guarantee that this, this partial T of the covariance matrix is positive semi-definite. So you're not in a setting where you prove this with Gauss and Martingales. Instead, there's a elegant proof with characteristic functions that we, we put forward in the paper. And after circulating this paper, we realized that such things have appeared independently in the, the QFT literature. So QFT and some friendly reviewer pointed us to a paper by Mark Hewer and co-workers from 24 years ago, where they also had something like this. They called it a Gaussian Ito formula. That was the, the, the name of the paper. So that's quite funny. Um, anyway, we rediscovered something. So in the end, we're happy, of course, that this is properly embedded. Let me say one more thing. Where does this magic rate 3H plus one half come from? Well, I mean, the, the explanation is you write them down, you compare them. And at some point, you you come to expressions of this that describe the difference. And so if you know what this phi is, so phi is the one that we had earlier, then you can read off what is the behavior of this one. And in the end, it becomes to understand somehow the behavior of this integral. So it's it's not a perfectly good back of the envelope computation where you say immediately, aha, this is why it is. So you really have to do the computation. Um, as I said, Thomas is around, so maybe he can um, you know, give you more details on this if you, if you want. Um, all right. There's also a, a part in the paper where we go back to the setting of Garcia cubic with the simplest function you can you can think of like a rough Steinstein situation. And in that situation, you can also give it lower bounds. So that gives you that this rate three H plus one and a half is sharp. So this is here to stay. All right, I have uh, not so much, my time is not a little slower than I wanted to be. Moments and beyond, um, all right. So I will skip 
the small talk about expected signatures, I believe a part of the audience is uh, informed about expected signatures. So you have uh, suitable stochastic processes where you can solve such linear differential equations in the tensor algebra, and that gives you what's called the expected signature. So this object is enormously popular. So sorry, let me get my, my language right here. When you solve this guy here, you get the signature. If X is a random process, so that this makes sense, you get a random signature, and then you can take component-wise expectation and you get the expected signature. Okay, so now I got it right. And it was a brilliant idea by Oberhauser and his then student Bonnier to introduce the signature cumulant simply by taking the logarithm of this object in the tensor algebra. And well, if nothing else, you should observe if we're in a setting where D is one, so if you're looking at scalar value semi martingales or, or whatever processes that allows you to do this, then you're really looking here at, then you're really looking at moments or classical cumulants. So this construction strictly generalizes classical moments and cumulants to a much bigger setup that tell you about behavior. So the downside here is, you know, you don't learn much about what the process did in between. And so the expected signature fills in that, that gap or that, that um, discrepancy and really gives information what happened in between. And there's a very nice uh, formula in D equals one, dimension of one. So now we're really talking about moments, forget signatures. This is a classical moment generating function. This is the cumulant generating function. There's a nice functional relation here that, that uh, I think appeared maybe implicitly here and there, but it was pointed out very explicitly in my paper with uh, Jim Gatherell here in this diamonds and, um, and forests um, that you can see. It. So this is the object you're interested in and it appears here as well. Okay, so it's a functional relation. And if you're in a Markovian setting, in a Markovian setting, this guy here satisfies a linear backward PDE. By the time you take the log, you do a Kolhoff transform. So this is somehow, um, a, you know, a, a pathwise version or, or, or a probabilistic version of something that would otherwise be a, a nonlinear PDE with a quadratic nonlinearity. The quadratic here, here's the quadratic variation bracket that um, come, I mean, represents the, the non-linearity here. So I have to run here. Interesting, I mean, coming back to our main topic here, this applies directly to Ralph Heston and in his paper with Martin Keller-Ressel, Jim Gatterall actually used a very similar technique to devise the, uh, the convolutional Riccati equations that you can obtain in that setting here. The proof, I, it's, there's a shorthand waving proof. I don't have the time, I'm sorry. Um, what I wanted to show you is that this has a, an extension here to higher dimensions. And so now we're talking really about past space um, signatures, expected signatures. And in the end of the day, the, so this here is the, so now you do the, instead of the increment, you have the, the signature over, you know, the little t to capital E. So it's a dynamic view. And um, you look at the conditional expectation time, little t, you take the log. So these are the condition or conditional log signatures. And you have a functional relation that tells them it's the same as one, two, three, four, one being this one, two being this one, three being this one, four being this one. So I can't introduce all the things, but let me just point out this at here is, I mean, K, we're living in a, this takes value in the tensor series that start at zero. And there's a common data bracket, there's a Lie algebra structure around. And so the at is exactly what you have. You take the, the Lie bracket with this guy, think of it as linear operator and H is a is basically um, an analytic function that starts with one where you can plug this in. So it makes sense as an operator. This is what you what you use here. And if you are back in dimension D equals one, and this just disappears, this is one. And so this thing here up becomes exactly X, the increment of X, okay? Same here, this guy here becomes this increment here, now of the quadratic variation. And then there are the similar remarks for the other terms, but again, I 
don't have time to introduce all this. The point being, there is an extension of this very neat formula here, which is itself somehow, you know, uh, new enough, I would say, or at least, you know, the usefulness of it is has been made very explicit now. There's also a nice paper by uh, Vargas where they, they uh, use, well, they have some related results. Um, so, and if you line it up, maybe that I should show you, here, there's a quadratic variation, right? So if you split this up and you expand this in the in the three terms that it, right, this is what I've done here, I've expanded this in three terms, then this really lines up with the one, two, three, four here. So it's, a, it's an extension that we're quite happy with. Um, that one I skip. And let me go to the to the finance theme here. I realize I have uh, okay, I have eight minutes left, but then no time for discussion, which would be a pity. Um, if we go back to variances or variance processes, uh, and here I've taken deliberately a very simple example. So VI is, is Gaussian here, but I put it in this this Volterra structure here. Then I can in this simple model. Uh, I can write down the four advantages. Here they are. And so now, you know, this is not the same in Martingale. So my previous discussion would not apply, but the forward variances are. So this is the beauty of the forward variance modeling that, that no matter how, you know, what your spot variance process does, you can always put yourself back to, you know, potentially infinite dimensional uh, Martingale setting. So now we are back in business and you can just start working out what is the, um, the expected signature of this process here. And this process here, I is one, two in my situation, it's a two dimensional process. So when dimension D equals two and this whole discussion we, we have is somehow applies non-trivially. And I've written out a few first uh, terms for you. There's a general picture, but I don't write it down. All right, I have now a choice of calling it a day or mentioning at least very quickly this third part. And the third part is also with uh, you know with co-workers and let me emphasize in particular Luca Bellizzari who should be with you or nearby okay so maybe I give myself three minutes for this and then you can quiz Luca on everything that remains and the simple thing was that if you go back to this Bachelet type stochastic volatility that if you condition on W and remember W was the fact that it somehow drives the variance. So V is FW adapted. And if you condition on this one, then you also phrase this one. And then there's only one primary factor left. Everything else is deterministic. And so you're in a Gaussian situation. So this was pointed out by Tusi 30 years ago, that in that case, the conditional law is Gaussian and that can be very that can be very useful. So it's like some intermediate step. You still want to get rid of this W later, but maybe when you do some, so conditioning means always there's some smoothing going on here. So you can do this at no price basically, because this is, you, you know, you can like use like Scholes or Bachelier formula conditionally and then average over them. And this is, might be an interesting alternative to, to doing it everything from scratch. So there's some, some Gaussian structure hidden in there that you, can carve out by conditioning that applies to generic stochastic wall models. So this could be rough or whatever. Okay. So our question here was, what happens when you include this leverage function? So you may remember my advertising at the beginning that this model here, at least, uh, so this is the Bachelier version of what I showed you earlier, is somehow industry standard. And so what happens to this 2C trick in that setting here? And of course, everything breaks down because this is not, you know, there's no more Gaussian structure, but Formally, at least, if you freeze this guy here and then this one becomes, you know, frozen, deterministic, whatever, then you have a Markovian structure, okay, that depends in a very non-trivial way on this frozen stuff because the frozen stuff here, especially this one, is very rough, okay? So what do you do? This one is also I mean, very bad, right? So you can make this precise and I'm really out of time here. And for that one, so now, you know, I'm, or you may know I'm a rough pass fan. Um, you can, the trick is 
to view the condition, the stuff that you condition on, so W or the DW, and this one together. And you don't want to make any assumptions on the VT, right? I don't want to say that this is a nice function of X or something where you can do expansion. So this could be very, very bad, out of reach of any Taylor-based rough mass expansion. So you just take this guy with you on board and think of this package guy here. And now what you turn to rough mass is not the Brownian noise, but this Martingale noise here. So you can rewrite this equation here this is just calculus, stochastic calculus rewriting. You can introduce this extra martingale here. And well, here it is and rewrite it. And now you're in a situation where you can just view this one as an eta rough pass and therefore provide the correct robust analysis of this thing. So this B here stays alive as a, or should stay alive as a, um, as a brown motion, but this M here will be frozen. So you have a situation of a differential equation that has simultaneously Eton noise and rough noise in the sense of terralize. And so these things are called rough SDEs and we start to understand them better and better. So it was a nice paper with Skoa, Lee and Antoine Hoquet, but for the purpose of this project here with Luca, Christian and Peter Bank, uh, this was not necessary because, you know, it's for rho being deterministic or, or constant, um, there's, you know, this this general approach using stochastic sewing does not add much in the in terms of the result in the end of the day. But in a general setting, it, so here we are, and well, I'm almost there. So if you call I now some some generic Ito rough path, that's why I, then we're dealing with this sort of information or equation. So this one you can solve. This is an intrinsic theory. If you randomize this I here with the Martingale, the Ito Martingale lift of the M then you get a process that is indistinguishable from the original one. So that's good news. And moreover, this one provides you a somehow rough mass continuous regular conditional view on the original process. So, and once you have this down, once you understand that this is a Markov process, right? I mean, it's not written here, but you can see it. This deterministic and here you have, this one is also determined and B is, is you know, independent noise that comes in. So there is accordingly um, and a PDE. So here it is. That's a rough partial differential equation with rough noise here that you better put in Stratonovich noise, um, terminal data, of course. And uh, you can go back to the original problem. So let's say the original problem is the option pricing problem by doing first the, the this one, okay? Then you have to properly randomize and average over the the law of this this Ito lift of the Martingale noise that we had earlier. So you have this generalized Romano 2C or how wide Romano 2C. So the Romano 2C formula itself is a generalization of how wide to non-zero correlation. And so this closes the story here. One reference, which I'm very happy with. And thank you very much. And uh well. Okay, I almost stayed in time. All right, let's thank you. And thank you very much. Uh, who has the first question? Oh, uh, this is our call here. Um, I'm glad to see that uh, the result was tedious. Um, that makes me feel not so bad about the paper we wrote with Christian with the H plus a half. Um. So who is uh, giving that comment or there's no question, right? No, there was no question. So I just got here a few hours ago and I'm exhausted. Um. <laughs> so as I, as I said, Christian... I know. There, Luca is there, Thomas is there. So whatever part of my talk you found interesting, there is, uh, you know, on-site information available. And please do not hesitate to reach out to me when you have detailed or other, any other questions. Right. Okay, well, if people really don't have any questions, let's thank Peter again. Okay, to be fine, and the reception will be there.
the, the posters uh, are set up already. So it will be today and tomorrow. Poster session as uh, last week, but with different posters this time too. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Yeah.